Thanks for the introduction and want to thank everybody for uh, doing such a great job of organizing and supporting our visit today. I'm going to kick things off with some uh, a brief set of remarks and then we'll, we'll turn to questions that were uh, submitted beforehand. And also, as you'll see, uh, we have an opportunity for uh, you to, to ask questions during the course of the, the event as well. So I'm going to kick, some th uh, kick things off with some basics about the Federal Reserve System and the Fed Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC. And I'll, I'll say so a few words about my current thinking about monetary policy as well. But really the plan is for us to spend the bulk of the evening on your questions. But I want to emphasize one thing before I start, and it's really important for you to keep it in mind throughout the evening. The views I'm going to express today are my own and not necessarily those of others in the Federal Reserve System including my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee that make monetary policy with me. So I'm going to be speaking for myself and not for anybody else. So in terms of basics about the Fed, I like to tell the uh, people that the Fed is a uniquely American institution. So what do I mean when I, when I say that? Well, if you look around the world, at all the central banks around the world, the U.S. central bank really stands out as being highly decentralized. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks that along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., make up the Federal Reserve System. So our bank serves as the headquarters uh, for Federal Reserve uh, System operations in the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. And that district includes the state of the North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, um, parts of Wisconsin, and, uh, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Now, eight times per year, the Federal Open Market Committee meets to determine the appropriate stance of monetary policy. So I'm not going to get into too many details uh, right now about what, what I mean by stance of monetary policy. We'll call on Scott later to, to, to carry that for us. <laughs> no, I will, I'm sure we'll get into that later, and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll be happy to, to explain that more. Uh, all 12 presidents of the various uh, regional Federal Reserve Banks, including me, and the governors of the Federal Reserve Board contribute to these deliberations. But the committee itself consists only of the governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and a rotating group of four other presidents. So all 12 of the presidents and the, and the five, now five governors are in there uh, contributing to the making of policy. But the people who actually vote on policy um, are the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, the five governors, and a rotating group of four other presidents. Last year, I was one of the voters on, pol on monetary policy. Uh, but this year, I've rotated off that role. The reason I think this is really uniquely American is because of how it mirrors the federalist structure of our government. We've got representatives from different regions of the country, the various presidents having input into FOMC deliberations. Now, as I've said at its meetings, uh, uh, the FOMC determines the appropriate stance of monetary policy. Now, and we'll talk, uh, I'm sure, about what stance of monetary policy means later. But let me talk, say a few words about what the word appropriate means. What are we trying to achieve through our monetary policy choices? So Congress has told us what to do. You know, the Federal Reserve is a creation of Congress through legislation passed by Congress. And they've told us what we're supposed to be doing when we make monetary policy. It's to, 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 to achieve two objectives, promote price stability and to promote maximum employment. And we've interpreted that first goal, that verbal goal of price stability, to mean keeping inflation close to 2%. Now, in order to meet these two objectives, promoting price stability and promoting max employment, the FOMC is targeting the Fed funds rate, which is a short-term interbank lending rate, near zero for over six years since uh, December 2008. There's been a lot of conversation recently about the desirability of initiating a gradual increase in the Fed funds rate sometime in this calendar year in 2015. So how can we, should we decide about the desirability of such a move? So my view, uh, I think the right way to think about the desirability of such a policy decision is through the lens of our goals, through the lens of our objectives. Would it help further our uh, being able to achieve our goals? Well, let's look at where we are in terms of inflation. So right now, personal consumption expenditure inflation, PC inflation, is running well below 2%. And my current outlook is that it will continue to do so for several years. So if you just look at prices alone, raising the Fed funds in 2015 would be inappropriate because we're below target right now in terms of inflation. Ra uh, uh, raising the Fed funds rate would slow down economic activity and further delay the return of inflation to our 2% objective. So that's on the price dimension. 
The other uh, goal we have is to promote max employment. And the labor market improved rapidly in 2014. It was a very good year for the labor market. But that one good year does not make up for several preceding disappointing ones. Really going back to um, 2008, we've had uh, um, six pre, uh, disappointing years before that and one good year in 2014. The FOMC can best fulfill its congressional mandate of promoting max employment by doing what it can to facilitate further labor market improvement like we saw in 2014. Why stop with just 2014? We should have more years like 2014. Again, this consideration argues against raising the Fed funds rate in 2015. So based on my current economic outlook for prices and for employment, the FOMC can best achieve its objectives by keeping the Fed funds rate target at its current level during this calendar year. One, a, a very important part of my message here, though, is that this conclusion is fundamentally an optimistic one. The data on inflation and employment show us that we could produce more and consume more as a country by utilizing more, utilizing more of our available human resources. Monetary policy can and should be used to make the desirable outcome happen. Thank you very much for listening, and now I look forward to taking your questions. So we want to point out, let's, uh, if we go to the first question, at the bottom of that slide, you'll see a phone number, and you'll see a hashtag. And if any of you have any questions during our conversation that you'd like to have asked, um, text it to that number or send it to that hashtag, and we'll check in in the back of the room and see if anything's been received. We have built some of your questions in already to what we're about to ask here. So, um, Narayana, as a first question, what is your response to those who criticize quantitative easing, too, as merely encouraging a bubble in asset prices? So let me give some context. Very good question. Let me give some context about what we mean by quantitative easing. Um, as I just mentioned, um, the, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee uh, faced a, a problem beginning in December 2008. So in, in, the, in the early part of 2009, the economy was doing extremely poorly. Really, uh, uh, we had an extreme number of job losses every month. But the, and the usual way that monetary policy would try to, to combat that, that kind of uh, undesirable outcome would be to stimulate the economy by lowering um, interest rates, by lowering the target range for the Fed funds rate that I just talked about. But it had already lowered it basically as far as it could at the end of 2008. So the, the committee turned to uh, alternative tools, really even uh, at the end of 2008, but then throughout 2009, which was to buy, not just set the short-term interbank lending rate, um, as I was talking about earlier, but to try to put downward pressure on longer-term interest rates as well by buying long-term assets. Primarily, these would be assets that were uh, issued by the uh, um, federal government or backed by the federal government. Long-term bonds are also mortgage-backed securities that were issued by uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which since the end of 2008 has basically been uh, uh, backed by the federal government. So what has been a, the effect of this policy? It, and we, uh, an enormous number of assets have been bought. We're now the, uh, uh, over $4 trillion on the, on the uh, Federal Reserve's balance sheet at this point, uh, and, uh, and the floor in these longer-term assets. And so what, what's been the impact of this policy? Basically, it's to put downward pressure on long-term interest rates. This has been, uh, I think, provided upward stimulus to the economy in terms of, of uh, um, supporting demand for consumption. When interest rates are low, what happens is people think to themselves, uh, it's easier to borrow because interest rates are lower, and it's less tempting to save because interest rates are lower. That stimulates spending both by consumers and households and by firms. That puts upward pressure on both prices and employment. It also puts upward pressure on asset prices. So when interest rates are low, um, when long -term, that basically is making uh, long-term assets like bonds and mortgage-backed securities more expensive, that in a, in, in, is, uh, one of the effects of that is that it, it inclines people to, be more, uh, to buy more stocks driving up the prices of stocks, and also to, to buy more housing, driving up the prices of housing. Uh, I think what's, uh, uh, what I would, I, I think those are effects are real, and they're helpful for the economy. If people have more wealth in terms of stocks, that stimulates more spending. If they have more wealth in their housing, 
that also stimulates spending. This is all part of the way um, policy is supposed to work. Now, I think the, the, uh, the word that I would object to here is the word bubble. I, I, I don't think that you look at asset prices now, I, I think it's very hard to see the kind of instability in asset prices. I don't see it in, uh, in asset prices right now as something indicating a bubble. Perhaps more importantly, we keep track of how investors are thinking about uncertainty in asset price movements through by looking at um, other asset prices, about financial markets are trying to think about risks. And we don't see any untoward risks about down, uh, sharp downward movements being priced into to, to, uh, stock prices, for example. So I, I think we've, we've encouraged, uh, we, certainly, the quantitative easing programs have stimulated the economy, pushed upward on asset prices, but this has all been positive. Uh, think, basically means prices and employment would have been lower had we not done this, which I, I think is true. Thank you. Do you think the uh, lack of rising wages in the United States is going to have a harmful deflationary effect on our economy? So now I'm going to get all technical. I, I, I think it's a very good question, but I'm going to parse between two words. One is deflationary, and the other is disinflationary. So by deflationary, when economists use that, they usually, they, they're talking about having inflation turn negative, actually having prices fall over time. I see the risk of that as being very low in the United States. Um, will it have a disinflationary effect on the, on the economy? Uh, that I'm more worried about. So we want to try to keep inflation close to 2%. That's our, one of our objectives. Um, having wages uh, as low as they are, having the lack of, uh, basically what this is telling us, the lack of rising wages is telling us is that there's uh, a lot of people available to work a lot of human resources are available, and they're not, we're not running up against scarcity and constraints in that. Otherwise, we'd see rising wages. The fact we don't see that means that um, it, can, it can lead people to, and firms to not push for price increases and lead people not to think that there's going to be price increases coming. All this pushes down on inflation. So I do think that the lack of wage pressure could generate disinflation. That is, um, Inflation run, continue to run below 2% or even falling further below our target. I think the risk of actually having deflation where prices are falling, negative inflation, is, is quite unlikely. And any thoughts about deflation or disinflation in Europe, in Asia, and how that might affect the U.S. economy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, one of the th reasons that we worry about this as economists is that we, you see what's happened in Japan over the past 20 years. Beginning in uh, the mid-90s, uh, the Japanese had a very sharp downward uh, fall in housing prices the early part of the 90s. And they also lowered interest rates in an attempt to bolster the economy. But essentially inflationary pressures and wage inflation pressures kept falling in Japan. And uh, they've gotten stuck in a deflationary pattern for many years. Uh, recently, the last couple years, they've tried through both fiscal policy and monetary policy to use stimulative, stimulative policy to try to uh, push upward on inflation and inflation expectations, but they continue to face challenges on that. Inflation remains very low in Japan, pretty, cl pretty close to zero. And in Europe, um, you know, I think uh, they face a challenging situation. Inflation is uh, well below th what their target is, and um, uh, they've se seen a slide in inflation, and also in what we call market-based measures of inflation expectations. These are essentially the bets that financial market participants are placing on where inflation is going to go in the future. In Europe, though, you see they're betting that inflation is going to be low. Um, and it, it, it's the same effect has happened here in the United States. The good news is it hasn't happened to the same extent. Um, we've also seen a slide in where market participants think inflation is going to go. But it, these are problems that are, the challenge is once inflation and inflation expectations fall and get stuck in a low level, it seems to have proven to be, for countries like Japan and for the European Central Bank, very, and now Sweden is trying to figure out how to do this, how do you get them back up it seems to be very hard. And we, so we don't want to get in that situation, that's for sure. So I'm going to check in with the back of the room. Got anything? Yes, we do, and I'm on. Uh, thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. Uh, Narayana, how does the rural nature of the 9th District impact your input on Fed policy? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It, so first of all, one of the things I was really, uh, I came to this job as, as described as an academic, as teaching in the University of Minnesota. And 
Uh, one of the things you learn quickly about the Ninth District, and you uh, describe uh, its, uh, its spread and its sprawl, is that it's not as uh, rural as you'd think. You know, a lot of the economy is, is actually uh, pretty well diversified, like the U.S. economy. Certainly, agriculture plays a bigger role in a state like uh, North Dakota or South Dakota than it does in the nation as a whole. But Minnesota is actually the, the, the kind of mix of activities across services and manufacturing and agriculture very representative of the nation as a whole. So you're not, that's, it's, it's not that different. With that said, uh, I do feel called upon to, as a president, to, uh, to talk to my FOMC colleagues about what we see happening in terms of the impact of uh, changes in commodity prices on the residents of the Ninth District, uh, changes in agricultural land prices on the Ninth District. Uh, but frankly, agriculture is a relatively small part of the nation's economy. Um, you know, we're certainly in the single digits of the percent of contribution of GDP, uh, probably the low single digits, in fact. Uh, it's a little higher than that for the Ninth District, but not um, uh, enormously so. So it's not going to play a big role in actually the kind, you heard how I talked about policy. I'm talking about the national economy, talking about how to, the outlook for national variables. What's happening in terms of the rural side of the Ninth District is not going to play that big a role in that. So please keep your questions coming in. Yep. We'll check Thanks. back in several times during the conversation and see what else is on your mind. Um, so we've talked about the map, and we've talked about how the car is doing on its journey. Uh, let's pop the hood and look <laughs> underneath <laughs> and ask a couple questions that are on some of the minds out there about the dynamics of the FOMC. Ah, so first, can you talk about the interpersonal dynamics during an FOMC meeting? Is there lively discussion? going on? Is it understated interaction? What does it actually feel like to be in the room and have these discussions? So the first thing I'll say is, okay, so this is a, I, I don't want to get into too much detail, but it, it's a beautiful room you're in. You're the boardroom of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. It's an enormous table uh, which fits the 17 of us and, and a, a large number of staff as well to, to help us with our deliberations. So you just the first thing you feel when you walk into this room and you sit at this table is just an enormous sense of privilege. To have this role in your country's life is just, I mean, it's just amazing. And my colleagues, um, you know, you're just struck by the level of, of uh, dedication that all these people bring to the task. And it's a very, I, I like the word, to use the word technocratic. It's very objective, neutral kind of conversation. It's not about, um, people staking out strong positions and trying to, trying, to, trying to argue with each other along those lines. It is not a uh, debating society. Uh, it is a, a situation where we're each asked in turn to speak about our views on the economy first. And uh, actually, first will be a staff presentation, and then uh, we'll each speak in turn about our views on the economy. And then a uh, staff presentation about uh, what they see as the likely policy alternatives, the most attractive policy alternatives before the committee. And then we'll uh, each speak in turn on those. Uh, the better, the, I would say most participants, including myself, are very aware of the fact that a word-by-word -word transcript is released five years later. And so people come in with prepared remarks. And uh, pretty much as I did this today, I'll uh, read from a script. Um, I think, you know, I think there's pluses and minuses from that. You know, monetary policy is something that doesn't, isn't, typically is not a short-term policy decision something that's affecting the economy with a lag of 18 to 24 months. There's no reason to get in the room and, and try to debate it out in a moment in time. So what happens is, is this gives rise to a slow motion debate. This kind of, so I'll say something in, 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 in March, and one of my colleagues will come back and say, you know, I checked this out with my staff. They've had the following things to say about it. Um, you know, usually it's not like we totally agree with you, but it's rather, you know, here's, here's the line, well, well, how we disagree with what you're saying. Uh, so, but that is, it, it is not, it's not an attempt to try to, uh, there's a, uh, Chairman Bernanke in, in introduced the idea of what he called two-handed interventions. So what does that mean is after each person speaks, um, after a person's finished speaking, you have, can have the opportunity to say, in the in midst of the meeting, have a contribution. That's not the standard way of interacting with the committee at all. It's really more this person-by-person -person contributions um, with the chair summarizing at the end to try to bring a sense of, of harmony among all the disparate views. And then uh, a meeting by meeting interchange as opposed to anything else. Where I will say that 
just an enormously collegial group. We get along very well. Uh, the presidents work together on as uh, really administrators for the whole system. I mean, you have to be collegial in that interaction. I mean, there's no other way to be, as you would well know from your job. You, you have to be able to cooperate, collaborate in that, in that role. And we get along very well in, that, in, that, in both spheres, I think. So it's been a very fun group to be a part of. So then I, I think probably the flip side of that question is given the, the pr privileged, you said, you yeah. felt privileged to be there and the kind of rarefied atmosphere that that is, I'm, I'm going to the next question on the list here. How can members of the FMOC connect with the lives of real people? When, when you're in that room and it's this kind of very rarefied uh, slow motion debate, uh, what, what can you do, what do you do? Well, you're doing something right now, you're here talking to us, but what can be done to stay connected to the lives of the people who are so affected by these decisions? So, first step is, I think this is a, a challenge for us as monetary policymakers. I suspect it's a challenge for all policymakers. I think that, um, you know, I, I talked about how employment's, recovery and employment's been very slow. Um, one of the data points we just recently looked at was the fraction of people aged 25 to 54 who have a college degree and how that's behaved over the last six or seven years. So this is the fraction of people aged 25 to 54. We're doing that to try to strip out the fact that so many people are getting to be retirement age. That's why we're looking at 25 to 54. And then we're looking at those people who have a college degree. If you just focused on that variable alone, you'd say we're back to sort of normal in terms of employment. It looks pretty much the same as it did in, in 2006. What does that point to? It points to you just can't. You can't just talk to people with college degrees, right? Because you're not getting the full experience of what's going on in the United States. Um, so we, we try to, uh, uh, speaking for myself, you know, we, we, uh, we try to reach out in a number of different ways. To, to, we talk to, today we talk to business leaders, but we also talk to community leaders to try to get a sense of, of um, some of the challenges that might be faced by workers as well as by employers. Um, more generally, you know, I talk, try to talk to labor leaders as well as to business leaders to get sides from both sides of the, of the, of the, uh, of the bargaining table, as it were. Uh, but it is an ongoing challenge, I would say, absolutely. So one of the things that uh, the folks are struggling with is saving for retirement. Um, yeah. We want folks to save for retirement, but interest rates are low, really yeah. low. So how do we reconcile that in terms of the low interest rate policy with long-term individual needs, saving for retirement, uh, folks being able to look forward to a bright future? I think it's a great question. And it's a, we're just in a globe, a world of low interest rates right now. Uh, and I, I think it's important to realize that this is not a creation of this particular FOMC alone. You can go around the world and look at interest rates different parts of the, uh, the globe and look at um, really very long-term interest rates. And you'll see the same pattern of very low interest rates. And I, I, I like to spin it in terms of low interest rates are the same as high prices. So when interest rates are low, that's telling you that people are willing to pay a lot for getting stuff in the future relative to today. That's what, a, that's what low interest rates means. There's a, we, I think there's a temptation to think that we've created, that is the FOMC's created that lower interest rate environment. The, the fact of the matter is we're responding to that low interest rate environment just as much as, as the, the, the people that are describing this question. We're facing the challenge that we have to keep interest rates low in order to hit our objectives. Just like people saving for retirement are trying to hit their objectives by saving and finding it hard because interest rates are low, we're finding it hard to hit our objectives for that, uh, because the global interest rate environment is as low as it is. And, uh, our objective is being keeping inflation at 2% and employment at, at maximum. I, so I, the, the, really what this is, is if you're in the world of trying to save for retirement, you look at Europe, people are aging. Um, they have an even more of a uh, demographic challenge than we do of more and more of their uh, citizens getting to be older. China, the same thing is true. Um, it's, a, uh, a, a, it's a very uh, unusual situation in China, an emerging market, um, uh, still uh, relatively uh, less developed than the United States in terms of per capita income, but also is facing demographic challenges of more and more people getting to the retirement age. So all of this is, boy, people, lots of people want to save. At the same time, um, uh, a lot of financial institutions are being asked to hold a lot more uh, safe assets 
all of this is creating a demand for government bonds and long-term government bonds that is a, uh, a challenge for, for individual savers as being described here because now you've got a bunch of other individuals around the world that are trying to do exactly the same thing you are. They're all trying to save. That's going to make it very expensive to save and make the yield of saving very low. That creates a challenge for us, too. In order to hit our objectives, we have to keep it interest rates low. So that tees up the next question beautifully. Are we going to hit 2% by 2018? Uh, if not, when are we going to hit 2%? My benchmark outlook is that inflation will rise gradually back to 2% over uh, the next three years. With, we tend to focus a lot on our, what we call our point forecasts. So you, I'm asked, where do you think inflation is going to be in three years? And I tell you, I think it's going to be at 2%. There's enormous uncertainty about that. <laughs> and uh, we don't talk much about that. Both upside, downside, lots of uncertainty. So it could take longer, it could, but it could get there uh, faster. Um, then as a policymaker, though, I, I also have to think about the risks that, am I more worried about the upside risk of inflation running above 2%? I'm more worried about the downside risk of inflation running below 2%. And I'm much more worried about the downside risk. And the reason, we talked about some of the reasons already that we've seen in Europe and Japan, if inflation gets stuck at low levels, very hard to bring it back up, especially, boy, uh, our our toolkit's not as full as we'd like it to be. We've had interest rates low for a long time. Uh, we bought a lot of assets. So combating a situation where inflation was st stayed lower than 2% for longer than 2018 would be a very challenging situation. Um, and on the, on the flip side, if it goes up too fast, uh, if I turn out to be wrong in my forecast, we start seeing inflation pressures developing, uh, we know how to, it, it, I was saying it would be a, a task that I would enjoy, but it's, a, it's one that we can do, deal with. We know what how to deal with it, which is that sign that we've got uh, too much demand or all of the supply, we want to constrain that demand by raising interest rates to, to encourage people to, 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 uh, to save as opposed to spend. Thank you. Okay, let's go back and see what else is on the crowd's mind, please. Well, uh, take a break from uh, policy for a moment, Narayan. We have a question about uh, your work life. What does your average work day or work week look like? What's it like to be an F? Uh, Federal Reserve Bank President. I think this is your question, Dave, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, so I think um, it, the, the, it's, that's a really hard question to answer because there's no average day. Um, you just do a lot of different things. It's a great job from in terms of how, how uh, different it is from day to day. There are some days where I'm basically thinking, much as I did as an academic, about boy, do we have the right models to, to, to try to tackle the, the questions we have before us? It's probably, my thinking is more focused on the question, policy question than it used to be, but that's a, a typical a day like an academic day. Some of the days are engaged as I, I dis discuss where I'll get together with my fellow presidents, or I'll be talking to other system leaders about how can we best manage the system, just a straight management job. Um, and then there's the weeks sort of surrounding the Federal Open Market Committee meetings which are really all about planning for the policy decision. Then there are days like today, where we came out into Winona, um, we talked to uh, first uh, business leaders over lunch, uh, talked to bankers, talked to community leaders, and now having the opportunity to take your questions. There's no average day, and that's what's fun about the job. There is no average day. So when you were a student, like many of the students you see out here, I'm guessing you didn't dream you were going to be a Federal Reserve President. Um, from, for the students, what sort of should they be thinking about if, if this is a pathway they want to pursue? Oh, just be open to any opportunities that come along. Uh, keep yourself flexible. Never feel like you're locked into anything. Um, be curious about what kinds of opportunities can come your way. Uh, you're certainly, when I was a student, I didn't think about it. Uh, so when you, were, when you were 20, what, what did you think you were going to do? Um, I, I probably knew at that point I was going to be a, a professor of economics, um, but I, I wouldn't have thought of that as translating into a policy role. I was uh, you know, pretty uh, serious in the academic side, and so I would, uh, I, I would have seen myself as continuing that role. Uh, frankly, even as recent, you know, the thing that drove me into the policy sphere is much more what happened in terms of the crisis that hit the country is um, I just felt like I. I had done all this work and research and thinking about macroeconomic policy, 
I just thought I could be of service to my country at, at a time of need. If I had been, I would not have thought about doing this job in 2005. In 2009, because of the crisis, I, 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 this is a time when I wanted to be of help and service. But you just want to, in terms of many, if you're uh, 20 year olds right now, you're going to do a lot of different things in your life. You're just going to learn a lot of new things. Just keeping yourself open and being flexible about how to approach those, those new opportunities is, is my advice, I guess. So let me ask one more follow-up to that. So I, I hope you, you kind of heard that, that um, Narayana's time in the Fed started in 2009. Yeah. So you came in in the midst of uh, one of the largest economic uh, challenges that any of us will ever know. What was that like? How, what, what, what was it like kind of coming into that role knowing that that was a pretty steep hill to climb? You know, it's, as, I, as I said, I, I thought I had ideas and ways of thinking that could be of help. One of the great aspects of the Federal Open Market Committee in dealing with the policy challenges, it's a group effort. And you, it's a team effort. And you really feel like you're part of a group of people who are trying to work together to, to, to solve the, the very daunting problems that were on our, our plate. And, you know, and that team had a captain, and it was, you know, Chairman Bernanke was our captain. And so you've, you don't feel like it, it's certainly a, a big responsibility, but it's not, uh, your responsibility is to be an effective part of that team and working towards the goals that we have to achieve. And it's not that it's all on me by any, by, by any, by any means. So uh, bringing it kind of back to the question, these questions we got in advance, um, Bring this down, the, the challenge about inflation that we were just talking about, bring it down to the level of kind of the average American. Yeah. Um, what should they be worried about? What should they be, what would they expect to be experiencing? Is it something an average person needs to worry about? That's a great question because it, it's, you know, having inflation, uh, right now inflation is running uh, near zero year over year. But boy, that sounds like a good thing, right? Prices aren't growing. Uh, how can that be a bad thing? Um, it's a bad thing because it's a sign of something bad in the economy. Um, it's a sign that we're not using all our available resources in an effective fashion. That the demand that we have for uh, goods and services is not sufficient to employ all the human talents we have available in our country. So if you're concerned about wanting to take use and advantage that, we, that our country makes full use of its human resources, you should be concerned about that. And that's what having low inflation is a signal of. It's a sign that... Um, um, prices, because if we had enough demand to push, to push against the supply of resources in our economy, we'd have uh, wage pressures, uh, much, be much more significant than we face right now. Uh, we've seen very subdued wage growth since uh, the end of the recession in 2009. And that would translate uh, at some point into price pressures as well. So I think the way you should be thinking about having inflation being low is that it's a sign of underemployment, of unemployment being uh, too high and unemployment being too low. Now, how much is it? So I, how, how should you do that translation? I think it's very hard to know quantitatively exactly how to do it. But we've done some estimates of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And if you think of inflation right now, I, uh, core inflation, which strips away food and energy, goods and services, that's a good thing to do if you really want to know what Energy prices move around a lot, and you want to strip those away if you want to get some, uh, something closer to the true underlying movement in inflation. That's really in the low, about a little under 1.5%, 1.3% right now. That, that sounds pretty close to two. But it really is, uh, if we've done our, when you translate that into unemployment space, it's more like two percentage points of unemployment. Well, that's a lot. And so that's a lot of underutilization of human talent that's going on in the United States right now. So that's what you should, how, that's how I think about it from my point of view, how I motivate myself to care about the fact that inflation is running too low. So the next question, probably good to remind everybody that no uh, policy is being pro proclaimed from this podium tonight. Um, but we talked about the 2018 inflation targets of 2%. When do you think interest rates are going to be raised? Oh, wow. So I'm, re I'm repeating your <laughs> disclaimer. <Yeah. laughs> um, so. I've talked, I talked today about my own views on that. So the first thing is that we always get asked this, when do you expect the interest rates to be raised? Uh, you know, it's uh, impossible for me to give a talk of any kind without that question being asked. But it's sort of the wrong question in the sense that it's really what conditions would lead 
me to favor interest rates being increased. That's really more what I, I, you should be asking me or think you, you want to know from me. Um, and uh, I want to see my uh, one to two year ahead outlook for inflation being back to 2%. So right now, my outlook for inflation is not going to get back to 2% until 2018. Well, that's a very long time. I would like to see it us getting back to inflation, our inflation goal much more rapidly. Um, and at one to two year ahead, why do I say that? That's the usual lag we think of monetary policy operating. So when I translate it, that can, those conditions for an interest rate increase into, uh, one other thing is I want to see these market-based measures of inflation expectations that I talked about earlier, the bets that people are putting on inflation. I want to see those going back to normal. They've, they fell over the last six months to eight months. I want to get those normal, see those normalized. With that, so those are my own conditions. That leads me to think that inflate, we should be de deferring an initial increase in the Fed funds rate target under my current outlook into the next calendar year, really into the second half of the next calendar year. So that's my view. Now, I'm not speaking for the committee, as I indicated earlier, and this is not the committee's perspective. Now, how do you know that that's not the committee's perspective? Every quarter, so every other meeting, the uh, participants of the meeting will release their forecasts for how they think, how they would set interest rate, uh, interest rate policy if they were in charge. So they're asked, we're each asked, all 17 of us are asked, what would you do with interest rates if you didn't have a committee? You were in charge of interest rates singularly. Um, so uh, anyway, so it is the counterfactual we're asked about. So um, of the 17 participants in the meeting, 15 of them said, if they were in charge of interest rates, they would, see, they would uh, lift them off their current low level in 2015. So only two people said it would be after 2015. I'm not allowed to say that I was one of those two people. But you can make your own surmise about that. But 15 of the 17 said they wanted to see an interest rate increase in, in, uh, in 2015. You think they're, thank you. Um, what long-term impact, if any, do you think might come from Congress's uh, apparent unwillingness to invest in the infrastructure of the United States, kind of failing infrastructure, let's say? What, what long-term impacts are going to come if we don't kind of reinvest in our infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, here, so I'll, again, some of the context here. You know, I'm a, a, um, a maker of monetary policy. One of the great things about the United States is that we're, uh, those of us who make monetary policy, um, I'm not an elected official, um, and a, I'm an appointed uh, official. Um, I'm given a tremendous amount, we all are on the Federal Reform Committee, given a tremendous amount of latitude by Congress to make monetary policy. Uh, there's conversations about restricting that, but that's, that, that right now we are given a tremendous amount of latitude. Uh, that's a very good thing. You, it's, a lot of research has shown that you want monetary policy to be free of these short-term uh, electoral pressures that, that uh, politicians, quite according, as they should be, given the electoral system we have, are very responsive to. And you don't want monetary policy to be facing those same things. I give you this context because I'm very reluctant, in general, to make comments about uh, fiscal policy. Uh, they, I, I, the, the deal is I don't say much about fiscal policy. They give us the latitude. Uh, the implicit deal is we give us, they give us the latitude to. Um, you know, I, so, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't put Congress in here. This is, uh, um, you know, right now I think that, um, I, I would put this in terms of just an economic decision that interest rates are very low right now. That means that if you were running the U.S. government as a business, um, your uh, opportunity cost of funds are very low. Um, and, and just running it from a profit-making <laughs> Uh, viewpoint, which you may or may not argue is the right viewpoint, boy, you would might think that if you can borrow at 30, for 30 years at a 2.5% interest rate, which is what the U.S. government can do right now, there might be a lot of projects that are available for you to, to take advantage of. But, uh, you know, and, and, but there's trade-offs always. You know, uh, investing in that means you can't do other things. And so it's, it's, uh, and it's not, I am for I don't, I, that's not my job to sort through that. That's Congress's job, but, but ultimately, it's our, all our jobs as voters to sort through that. Congress, it, there's this sense that Congress is somehow disconnected from the American po uh, uh, populace. I never get that sense when I talk to people. I think some of the, 
the challenges, the, 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 the debates we hear in Congress with the president, uh, I hear them when I talk to people as well. So. And back to the back of the yes, room. We have one from the Twitterverse, very exciting. History has shown that extended periods of low rates has always led to a massive boom and bust. How is this time any different? Um, you know, these are tough questions to answer because it's sort of the premise. I don't, I don't, I don't even, I don't think it's, it's, the, it's not my characterization of what I see in the, the economic data. Um, so there, the two periods of very low interest rates that I'm familiar with are in the United States um, in, during the Great Depression, and um, essentially uh, interest rates are kept near zero for. Um, very long period of time, probably close to a decade. Um, you can only see that as having been a period of very subdued economic activity. Uh, unemployment was in the uh, double digits throughout that time frame. Um, you know, we saw some very fast growth at time period during some of that the 1930s, but in general, I, th I think that was an experience of just being a bust, having followed a boom. Same in Japan, we have very low interest rates now. Uh, Again, they've been low for 20 years. Hard to see the boom in Japan that's taken place because of low interest rates. But what is true is that low interest rates are typically been a response to a protracted periods of low interest rates have followed booms. And I think that's a good question. Why is it that the busts that have taken place after um, booms like we had in the US in the 20s and in Japan in the 80s and uh, in the 80s have led to such protracted um, uh, periods of subdued economic activity that have led the central banks to, to, to adopt low interest rate policies. But very hard, I think, in the 30s in the United States or in uh, the last 20 years in Japan to see it booms anywhere in sight. And I, I would say now, I, I, I don't see uh, the dangerous boom being created by our low interest rate policy at all. I mean, employment remains very subdued and prices remain very subdued. Um, you know, asset prices have risen gratifyingly, I think, since uh, March of 2009. But really, um, if you normalize for GDP growth and for price growth, still remain uh, relatively low. What do you think about technologies like Bitcoin and their possible impact on global finance? This is just an exciting time. To, uh, I have been... Um, I study payments, this is the, the, the economics of how people pay for things um, as part of my research. And it was generally treated as a sort of boring uh, <laughs> stepchild of macro and you know, people didn't pay much attention to it. Now it's really exciting because of, of things like Bitcoin. Um, I, 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 so Bitcoin has two pieces to it. One is this, uh, this private currency aspect. Um, you know, I think that's something where they're mo we continue to monitor the Federal Reserve, we keep track of. I think the technology aspect, that's really more interesting. And the use of, of the blockchain kind of um, record keeping device, um, I don't know where that's going to go, but the development of something like that has been, uh, I, I think is, is very interesting. More generally in payments, the speed of how people can make payments now, and, um, and I think the continuing evolution we see in, in and both here in this country and in other countries, um, is, uh, is a very, it uh, makes this a revolutionary time, really, in this area. And, um, and it's, it's just a space we're going to continue to see change in the next 10 years. It could be very rapid. Is it anything even within the, the realm of the Fed to this is something affect that, or? <laughs> well, the, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, actually, because I'm uh, the... Uh, we recently released a paper um, called Strategies for Improving the U.S. Payment System. And uh, essentially, uh, we're embarking at the Federal Reserve System, really through our convening role of bringing together different players in the payment system, stakeholders in the payment system, I should say more broadly, not just players, but stakeholders in the payment system, to talk about the best way forward for U.S. payments in terms of how do we get more speed? How do we get more security? And there's a lot of different, uh, people, people have different uh, views about how to, how to achieve these objectives. We're trying to bring them together to find a, the, the best way path forward. Um, we have a, uh, why, why are we doing that? Well, part of the central banks are always involved in payments uh, around the world, but we have a distinct operator role of the Federal Reserve. 
in terms of uh, we, we clear checks, we uh, run an ACH business, uh, which is a, facilitates another form of retail payments. And uh, interbank payment system, we run one of those as well, wholesale. So uh, we have an operator role, which is very uh, important for, for the organization. And though we also have this public policy role trying to facilitate uh, change, uh, lead to more security and more speed. I mean, it raises an interesting question about sovereignty and um, control if uh, with technology, with Bitcoin, um, creating a world where governments se would seem to have less influence over what's happening. Is that uh, just kind of an anomaly of this moment in history or is there a, is there a trend in that? No, I, 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 when I look at uh, things like Bitcoin, I think about it more as just facilitating a faster form of payments. And I'm not as, I, I, you're emphasizing more, I think, the use of uh, it as an alternative currency. I think of it just more as uh, a technology which facilitates, a, a, and there, you know, Bitcoin gets a lot of press. There's other technologies being developed that also have these kinds of properties that are faster as well. Mm -hmm. And I think these are, these are just things to keep watching and, and uh, we'll have to see how they unfold. So, so let me ask you a question then about a, a currency with a little more of a track record. Uh, what, what are your opinions about a weak euro and its effect on the U.S. economy? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, this is just one of the channels through which uh, monetary policy affects uh, the, the, uh, the economy more generally. Um, you know, we talk about interest rates uh, having a tighter monetary policy. And essentially, we, over the last, since uh, the end of 2013 especially, but even before that, um, the Federal Reserve Committee have taken uh, steps to um, attempt to tighten the, the stance of monetary policy. Um, this has led uh, to upward pressure on the U.S. dollar relative to other currencies. Uh, this means that it is a, it's a drag on the U.S. economy to have, a, a, uh, have this appreciation of the dollar. Um, that's just, that is how tighter monetary policy, one of the ways tighter monetary policy affects the, affects the economy. Um, I think in general, it's good for us as Americans to, ha to have strong, a strong European economy, strong Japanese economy. The rest of the world, having a strong rest of the world economy is really good for us. And what, you know, whatever can be done to, to facilitate that is good. Thanks. Any more? Are we on? Yes. Uh, so you've talked a lot about inflation and the, the Fed's target of 2%. What does the Fed consider to be maximum employment in the current economic climate? Yeah, this is a great question because there's a lot of uncertainties about it. Um, we have an estimate of where the long-run unemployment rate will be. It's consistent with 2% inflation. Uh, at the last meeting in March, we all submitted uh, um, forecasts for that. Um, they were all, you know, the, the low 5% range. Uh, right now, unemployment um, pretty close to that, around 5.5%, and now it's the estimates of where we're going to be in the long run are between 5 and 5.2. Um, but if you've tracked those, you keep track of those estimates over time, they've fallen steadily over time. My own estimate, if you go back two years or so, was over 6 and now is uh, down near 5. And we're, we have serious discussions at the staff level of, of lowering even further. Now, what's making us do that is, if, if we were really close to max employment, you would think we'd see more wage pressures than we do. You know, if we're gonna see, have, be close to an unemployment rate, which is indicating that we're run out of uh, bodies in terms of or we're pushing up against max employment, uh, you'd start to see more wage pressures, start to see more inflation than we're seeing right now. And so that, that my, my own perspective is that um, I think we're gonna, we could, well have a lower unemployment rate than 5% consistent with 2% inflation. We're still thinking about that question in Minneapolis. But on the, on, in terms of employment itself, I think the fraction, right now the fraction of people who, uh, of, of uh, people over the age of 16 have a job is 59.3%. I think, think that could be much higher, uh, much closer to where we were in, in uh, late 2006 without generating inflationary pressures. I don't know where exactly we, we could be, but I know we could be doing better than we currently are. So that, that's, that's how I think about the policy. Uh, uh, it, the reason it's so hard to forecast is long run employment in the US is shaped by a number of factors that, that frankly are just outside the control of monetary policy. 
Uh, but we have to look at prices, we have to look at wages, we have to look at the, pa the path and pattern of employment data. And what I say when, you look, when I look at that is we could be doing better than we're currently doing in terms of promoting maximum employment. So I've got a question for the students out there by a show of hands. How many of you are studying economics? Okay, good luck with money and banking. Um, Narayana. That's the kind of support economists <laughs> love. Don't to come get. to me yeah, for tutoring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Narayana, what advice do you have for our students out here who are interested in pursuing a career in economics? You know, it's such a different field from when I entered it. It's become so much more empirical and data oriented than it was when uh, I was in school 30 years ago, or, you know, frankly, a little more than 30 years ago. And um, I just think that learning how to use statistical methods, learning how to use data, the more opportunities you have to get involved with as an intern with research opportunities to, to get yourself familiar with that, boy, you're going to be a better economist because of it, but you're just going to be a lot more, well, you'll be able to. Have, you'll have a lot more opportunities available to you of all kinds if, you, if, 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 if you're able to do that. So I, uh, I think it's been a huge transformation in our field is we, we had to rely purely on pretty much what I, I think was deductive methods, uh, assuming things about people's behavior and firms' behavior and then reaching conclusions. I, I think that's still a very powerful methodology and I, I, I use it all the time myself, but we're able to supplement it and complement it in such effective ways by a range of data and a range of statistical methodologies that just were not available to us in, uh, in, the, in the 80s. And I think uh, getting yourself familiar with that as a, as, a, as, a, as a college student is really, really helpful. And there's a certain amount of technical uh, mathematical training which is useful to have, you know, some calculus. Uh, it's not, it's a little bit of a barrier to entry to the field. Uh, get it over with, get on top of it and you'll find it a useful tool thereafter. The real, it is not where the interesting questions lie, but it is the language we use as economists to talk to each other. And so it is important to get that on, uh, on the table. Um, yeah, so th those, I guess, would be my advice. The final advice for anybody, any student in the, the room, but even those of us who are older is, um, you know, when you're thinking about what you want to do with your life, do something that you really like. Um, you're just going to be doing it a long time. You're going to spend a lot of hours on it. Your life is just going to be a lot happier if you choose something to do that you like. And uh, really, I really counsel, counsel students, but you know, as I say, all of us should, should follow that. Um, the refreshments are ready, and we are able to have a little more conversation informally with President Kocha Lakota over treats over here. So that concludes the formal part of our program. We're going to move over there and have refreshments. President Coach Lakota is going to stick around a little bit longer, but for now, would you thank, help, join me in thanking him for coming to Winona State University? Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>